Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this program today we'll be discussing the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Judea and Samaria. That is the biblical heartland of the State of Israel. Warm welcome to the program and uh, my guest is all the way from the biblical heartlands of Judea and Samaria in the state of Israel and my guest is Sonja Oster Barras who is the director of Christian Friends of Israel Communities. Uh, Sonja welcome again to the uh, Middle East Report. Thanks it's great to be here. It's, it, this is good it's becoming an annual event so Absolutely. E every <laughs> June uh, you're here to do a program with us which is great and to give us that inside view into what's happening uh, with the Jewish communities in the biblical heartland of Israel uh, essentially the real pioneering Jews of the state of Israel. Absolutely. I, I start off the program so can you just give us a little bit of uh, an indication about how your speaking tours and engagements have been I know that you've been to Jersey you've been to Bristol uh, and how's your speaking and tour gone so far in the UK? It's been good I'm now at the end of it I've uh, been here almost a week and actually more than a week and uh, I was also in Wales and in a number of other places um, in and around England and Wales um, I think people are very enthusiastic, people are um, excited. Uh, our challenge, of course, remains reaching much larger audiences and uh, turning on more and more Christians in the UK to not only get involved with Israel, but to come out and get a new understanding of what this whole settlement issue is all about. Could I ask well, well, just a little bit of curiosity because I was thinking prior to the program, why have you put your organisation's focus on Christians and not the Jewish community to realise the importance and significance of the Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria? Well, actually, when I started doing what I do, advocating for the communities in Judea and Samaria, I was speaking exclusively to Jews in a context of a different organisation, but there are actually a lot of people doing that. and. Um, how this organization got going is really it was because there were a few Christians who came by um, in Samaria where I was and, and said, you know, you're doing all this speaking to Jews. Um, Christians need to hear this message. And that was the first time it had ever occurred to me uh, or that I was that became aware that there would be interest among Christians for this. And so that's how it all began. And so the focus of our organization is on Christians because nobody else is doing that. And it really is a very important work. I believe that Christians are, are among our most important allies today. So yes, there are plenty of Jews out there speaking to the Jews. I'm the only one speaking to the Christians. Uh, what impact have you had uh, on Christians in the United States? Because clearly that is where the majority of the support from the Christian world to the state of Israel comes from. That's true. Uh, there is a lot. First of all, the American people in general are much more pro-Israel than they are here or in Europe or in most other countries. Um, but, and, and Christians even more so. Christians are also an important political influence and a group of people in, in the United States. Uh, so that really is, is a much, um, in a way it's an easier audience, but on the other hand there's also that many more uh, people, organizations, etc., that are running around the United States talking about Israel. Uh, so that, again, has its own challenges, being heard above the din. And again, we're representing a very unique message. Nobody else is out there talking about Judea and Samaria. And we are a controversial issue. So our challenge that we face is, uh, in the United States as well as in other countries, is um, to persuade people that want to keep their message even keeled, uh, not touch controversy, to, prevent, to um, persuade even Christian organizations and churches, etc., to say, no, this may be controversial, but it is a message that is biblical and needs to be heard by our audiences. So that's really one of our greatest challenges today. Yeah. So let's have a look at uh, the work being carried out by uh, Christian Friends of Israel Communities.
Christian Friends of Israeli Communities. Who are they? Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, also known as CFOIC Heartland, was established in 1995 as a Christian response to the 1993 Oslo Peace Accords. Christians around the world were concerned about Israel's territorial concessions and wanted a way to support the Jewish people in the biblical heartland, Judea and Samaria. CFOIC Heartland has three purposes. One, educate, two, visit, and three, support. To educate Christians about the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Help Christians visit these communities in Judea and Samaria. To provide an avenue for Christians to financially support vital community needs in Judea and Samaria. Since the beginning, CFOIC Heartland has stood with the Jews who are at greatest risk in Israel. Now that you know who CFOIC Heartland is, you can join our family today. By getting updates from Israel. Or by leading or joining a tour. Or by making a donation. We'd love to meet you. Join the CFOIC Heartland family. gives you some understanding of some of the very important work that uh, Sanja or organization is doing yeah, in defense of the Jewish communities in the Shomron and uh, Judea and Samaria and also the biblical heartland of Israel, uh, which is much better than saying the West Bank. Absolutely. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say, when, I, um, when, I actually, uh, uh, when we actually drove my wife and myself through the Jordan Valley, you can really see the difference there between the Jewish communities that are there and those are the Arab-Palestinian communities. Um, essentially, you go past a Jewish settlement, it, obviously it's got a lot of security, you see the big fences and the barbed wire, but you see the, the plants, you see the trees, you see the veg vegetation, and you see it so green. And then you see the areas that have been transferred to the Palestinian Authority, completely desert. You might see a nomad with a couple of sheep or a couple of goats, but that's it. It's almost as if the desert then, uh, the land turns into desert. Um, uh, and what is life like uh, for you living in, in the biblical heartland of Israel, knowing that you are fulfilling your, the role of your ancestors, such as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, I think that what you talked about, the, the land turning green yes. uh, as the Jews have come back, and I think this is something that is prophesied uh, and something that we are witnessing uh, being fulfilled today. I think it's in Ezekiel where God uh, speaks about the the, the land that will lay barren um, and, and that will only come back to life when the Jews come back. And we see that also in, in uh, Deuteronomy. And um, I think, I, I personally feel very blessed that I'm able to be a part of that. Now, I am personally not a farmer. That's not my thing. Uh, but there, as you mentioned, in the Jordan Valley and a few other places, they have done miracles. Uh, going into desert areas, sand, you know, no water, and yet with uh, all kinds of new uh, innovations in agriculture, producing some of the most amazing spices, plants, flowers, etc. In the Jordan Valley, you have the very best dates that you will ever taste, the medjool dates, and I think you can even get them here uh, in the UK if they haven't been boycotted. I know that's, that's an issue. But for me, you know, it's not just the farming, it's the communities. We have built communities, residential areas, there's a university in Ariel. There are yeshivas, Bible academies. There are schools and shops and businesses. There's a several large industrial areas where Arabs and Jews work side by side. And that's also something these, these uh, forces out there uh, that are trying to boycott these businesses that are producing valuable things or growing things in Judea and Samaria at the end of the day, when they boycott, they're hurting the Arabs, the Palestinians, more than they're hurting us. And, you know, we've seen this, we've seen this, uh, an example of uh, SodaStream, that was a company that was located uh, in Judea, 
and had employed hundreds of Palestinian workers. And because of the boycott, for economic reasons only, they moved to a different part of Israel. And the result was the Palestinians were no longer able to get to that facility to work. They lost their jobs. They were making five times what they are able to make in Palestinian companies or for Palestinian companies. So when people call on these boycotts, uh, and particularly I think that more and more Arabs today have a real uh, complaint against their own leadership for caring more about whatever buzz they have to put out there against Israel as opposed to helping their own people. Well, when, it, when you made Aliyah, I mean, you had the choice of, of living in uh, Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or, or Haifa or, or in, the, in the Carmel or even in the Negev, but uh, you chose to live in the biblical heartland of Israel. Um, why did you decide to do that? Well, first of all, when I was 18, I was in Israel, and I was there in Kedumim when that community was founded. Uh, it was a result of a really the beginning of the settlement movement, a massive grassroots um, campaign to um, get the Israeli government of that time, uh, which was a labor government and was not particularly supportive of settlement in Judea and Samaria. And because it was such grassroots support that had come around for this idea, the government relented and gave permission. And I was there. I was only 18. I was not yet living in Israel. I was only in Israel for a year studying. And that just gripped me. The idea, actually being able to see with my very eyes the fulfillment of Scripture and the fact that it wasn't just fulfillment of Scripture in general, like, yeah, one day the Jews will come back to Israel. That's exciting, too, because I know when I made Aliyah, when I came to Israel from the United States, I knew I was fulfilling Scripture. But then to do that on the mountains of Israel, to be in a place where I know for a fact the kings and prophets of Israel walked, Right in my neighborhood, we have found remnants of towns. There's really like a five-minute walk from my house. There is a remnant of a town, including agricultural um, lookout posts, including um, wine presses, going back to the time of the northern kingdom when we were living, when, where I am, was the tribe of Manasseh. I mean, it's that's mind-blowing to be able to go back and then say, here I am, two and a half, three thousand years later, whatever, here I am rebuilding and returning a Jewish presence to this area. You can't, you can't beat that. Living, I mean, living in Tel Aviv, with all due respect, doesn't compare. Absolutely. And uh, this year is, the, is, is a very special year because it's the 50th anniversary of the liberation of uh, Judea and Samaria from Jordanian control and also the uh, liberation and unification of Jerusalem. Uh, and now someone who lives in the Shomron, what does this mean to you? Well, it's, it's, it's a milestone. And, and I think we're seeing um, a, a certain shift in attitude and in uh, consciousness that is going on. More and more from within the settlement movement, from within people that have lived here and worked and struggled all our lives, I think for the first time, people are stepping back without arrogance, without complacency, because we know our battle and our struggle is still going on. But at the same time, sitting back and saying, it's been 50 years. This is not temporary. You can't reasonably expect this is all going to go away. I hear people saying things like, it's 50 years, let's act like it's been 50 years, you know? Like, stake our claim, go forward with the assumption we're here to stay, and, and we're seeing that growing confidence being put out um, at the highest levels of government as well. And, and it's, it's, it's exciting. It is really exciting. And how did your uh, community mark the 50th anniversary? of the liberations of the biblical heartland, particularly your event you had in the Israeli Knesset. The yeah, Israeli okay, Knesset. so that was really special. They had a, an event in the Knesset, first of all, a special session uh, of the Knesset devoted to marking the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Judea and Samaria. Before the Knesset session, though, there was a special reception where all the leadership of Judea and Samaria all the people who had been among the original settlers and founders. I mean, it was, it was by invitation only. By invitation only, but there were probably a few hundred people there. You know, But everybody there had a personal stake. Everybody there had been involved. And you could, could actually say, I did this. I was part of this. And I was very privileged to be part of that 
restricted list of invitees. Uh, it was hosted by the chairman of the, of the Knesset, Yuli Edelstein. Uh, our prime minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, spoke uh, and actually committed to continuing to build in Judea and Samaria. He made very definite statements that he was not going to allow foreign governments to block our right to build and that we would continue building um, all over, not just in the larger cities or in the so-called settlement blocks, but that we would continue to build everywhere. Unfortunately, since that, you know, we're, we're seeing a, a great deal of frustration among our uh, government ministers who are trying to see that turn into actual permits and, and, and into a reality, but that's a separate issue. But the, the celebration itself was, was really special, and you really felt that the Knesset, the government of Israel, was marking this as a special event. Let's have a look now at uh, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Jerusalem and uh, Judea and Samaria, and this will put it all in its historical context. June 11, 1967. What had begun as a battle for survival had become a massive victory. In only six days, Israel not only defeated an enemy that threatened to destroy it, but gained control of the territory needed to protect itself from future attacks. But this land meant more than just security. The land of the West Bank was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Also known by the biblical names of Judea and Samaria, it had remained central to Jews around the world and had maintained a continuous Jewish presence for 3,000 years until the War of 1948. Beginning in 1948, when Jordan captured the West Bank and Eastern Jerusalem, Jews were expelled from the region and were not allowed to access the Jewish quarter of the Old City, the Western Wall, or other Jewish holy sites. Following the Six-Day War with the reunification of Jerusalem and Israeli control over the West Bank, the Jewish people and people of all religions once again had free access to the respective holy places. After the war, Israel found itself in control of both land and population that it had no intention of governing before being thrust into war. Israel now controlled territory with about 950,000 mostly Muslim Arab residents. It now held the Temple Mount, the holiest site to the Jewish people, but also the site of a sacred Muslim mosque and shrine, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. In an unprecedented and controversial effort to promote peace and avoid further conflict, Israel turned over control of the Temple Mount and its Muslim sites to the Jordanians only 10 days after the war ended. The Israeli government also sent a message to the Arab countries through the U.S., saying that it was willing to give up territory for peace. But the Israelis received no answer. This would be one of many unreciprocated gestures of peace. Three months after the war, the Arab leaders met in Khartoum, Sudan, to discuss their next steps. They agreed upon a resolution that came to be known as the Three No's of Khartoum. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiations with Israel. Israel's Foreign Minister Abba Ibn later said, This is the first war in history which has ended with the victors suing for peace and the vanquished calling for unconditional surrender. Israelis were dismayed. They had hoped that their victory would open up an avenue to peace negotiations in which captured land would be traded for genuine peace with its neighbors. Instead, they were confronted by a flat refusal to negotiate for peace around any borders, the same position that preceded the war and one that most Arab countries and groups were to hold for decades after the war. Despite this history of strong rejection of Israel, later developments did lead to peace between Israel and some Arab countries. That puts uh, the Six-Day War in its historical context, which is important reminder, particularly when we look at uh, the facts that we know exactly what happened at the time. Uh, which leads me on, uh, Sonja, to talk about uh, your communities, because it was really the government of uh, Michin Begin, the first Likud government in the late 70s, I think, that started to push the drive for the building of Jewish settlements in the biblical heartland of Israel. How much do you have to thank uh, Michin Begin? and his government for that uh, push for the settlement drives? 
Oh, Menachem Begin is my hero. There's no question. He was an amazing man. He was a man of faith. He was a fighter. And he was a man of enormous dignity as well. And um, that first um, community that I was able to be present when it was founded, in Kudumim, that took place in, um, that was in 1975, the end of 75. I was there in January of 76. It was a year and a half later, in the spring of 1977, that Menachem Begin became prime minister. Well, the people who were the founders of that community, Kedumim, which throughout that period remained in a very temporary status, in a military camp, like up the hill a bit, living in caravans, the leadership of that community, who essentially, you know, they were just people, young men and women in their 20s, struggling to hold on to this land despite world pressure, despite uh, a cold shoulder from much of Israel, certainly from the government. The night that they announced Menachem Begin's victory, they decided that they were going to go and invite him, this newly elected prime minister, they were going to go and uh, invite him to come uh, and participate in a ceremony they were going to have two weeks later where they were going to bring, be bringing in a new Torah scroll into the community. They went to his apartment the next morning. It was, you know, late morning. And they knocked on his door. And Menachem Begin opened the door in his bathrobe. He had been up all night watching the election returns, just had a few hours of sleep, and of course he recognized them right away. And he welcomed them into his apartment. And this, this is, you know, for <laughs> most people today, if you think about it, prime ministers are usually surrounded by guards. You know, this was such a young and virgin time in Israel's history. He just welcomed them into his very small, modest, modest Tel Aviv apartment, and they came in and they invited him to come to their ceremony, and he said, with pleasure, I will come. Two weeks later, he shows up. He goes to Kedumim. He stands on this concrete slab, which you can go visit. They have, like, kept it aside with a sign saying, here stood Menachem Begin, you know. Anyway, he stood up there, and, of course, this was still during that period of time when they were doing the coalition negotiations, etc. His government had not yet been sworn in, but he got up there on that platform, and he said, there won't be many more communities just like this throughout Judea and Samaria. And very shortly after that, he came to the United States, and I was a young teenager at that point, and uh, he came to the United States, and he uh, was on one of the you know, television talk shows. And I remember then, actually I was a university student, I remember then uh, how he got up for the first time, and Israeli leader was said, the interviewer was saying, so I understand you have plans to, you know, put more Jewish settlements in the West Bank. And he said, excuse me, this is not the West Bank. This is biblical Judea and Samaria. And so there's no question, he, what he represented, what he believed, was the man who really pushed our efforts forward and launched us into what became settlement, widespread settlement of Judea and Samaria. Um, uh, Sonja, isn't it that uh, the uh, Jewish settlements, not only do they represent the rebirth of these ancient Christian communities, in the biblical heartland of Israel, dating back to biblical times, uh, but also they represent strategic value, particularly up there on the uh, Judean hills. No question. The, the Israel before 1967, there were 19 years between 1948 when Israel became a state and 1967 where we had this amazing victory that we didn't expect, that we weren't looking for. Um, and during that time, Israel, as it, at its narrowest point, was only nine miles or 15 kilometers wide. Imagine a country surrounded by enemies with that kind of width. It's, it's insane. So having that depth was, first of all, very important. You know, the, the, the Judean Samaria, the West Bank, added another, you know, 40 miles or so to the country. And the country itself was only about 50 miles wide. It's, it's a tiny country. But, you know, at least it gave us the depth. But on top of that, like you said, the Judean hills, that whole area, the Samaria hills, the Judea hills, it's up, it's elevated. We're talking about as high as 900 meters uh, above sea level, where you have on the west the coastal plain, which is at sea level. And on the east, in the Jordan Valley, you have areas that are up to 400 meters below sea level. So the area of Judea and Samaria, picture it as a fortress, if you will, you know, the fortress up on the hill. That's the whole Judea and Samaria. It really is vital for defending Israel. On top of that, we are sitting on the second most important reserve of natural water. 
So no question, uh, aside from the biblical and spiritual issues, Israel's survival relies very heavily on Israel's control of Judea and Samaria. And, and, and why are the Jewish settlements surrounded by so much controversy? I mean, you take, for example, the British government, uh, and particularly the Foreign Office, and on the whole, the British government is very supportive of the state of Israel, but incredibly hostile when it comes to the presence of the settlements. Uh, Europe, uh, in a sense, is completely anti the uh, settlements to the level of hostility and the fact they're actually building and sponsoring the building of Palestinian villages and towns under Israeli military control in Area C. Uh, and you also have the likes of the previous uh, US administration under President Obama who, who actually thought that the Jewish settlers were the most evil people in the entire Middle East and this is the biggest problem in the Middle East is the presence of these uh, Jewish homes on ancient biblical land. So why the controversy? Well, I think, first of all, we have to go back and understand the relationship that many of these governments have had over the years with the Arab world. Uh, I would say here in Britain, there has been a fascination with the Arab world since way before the state of Israel existed. I mean, I picture Lawrence of Arabia, you know, riding off into the sands of Arabia and doing all kinds of deals with the princes of, of Egypt. Britain had, uh, excuse me, of Arabia. Uh, Britain had long-standing interests, uh, added to it the whole oil issue uh, in the area. In the United States, I think um, some, of the, some of the interest in the Arab world came from um, all kinds of Arabists and Orientalists that were staffing the State Department. Add to that again oil, which was huge. And as you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the oil consumption in all of our countries grew the reliance on Arab oil grew as well. And the Arabs then used that in order to force or, or pressure the United States to, to, to um, you know, take a more, what they would call at least a balanced stand, which meant, yes, recognize Israel as a state, but insist that they give up all these wonderful places that they have liberated. Today, we would expect that that should be changing. First of all, in the United States, the United States is basically self-sufficient now in energy and oil production. They don't need the Arab world. Unfortunately, not all the experts in the State Department understand that that change has happened. I think President Trump figured that out, and I think he's, he's doing all kinds of things to change that. I think Europe is also a bit behind the times. Um, unfortunately, the Arabs have done an excellent job in convincing public opinion, particularly in Europe, that the Jews are the bad guys and the Arabs are the good guys. And I was just in London and walked along some main street, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but in central London, and I was horrified to see posters up there accusing, with Palestinian flags all over the place, accusing Israel of being baby killers, of persecuting the Palestinians. I mean, the most horrific posters are along this major thoroughfare in the middle of London. They are winning the war of the mines. And that is really, really unfortunate. And there aren't enough good people, particularly in government, but just ordinary people who are willing to stand up and say, this is a lie. Israel is probably the best place in the world for an Arab to be living. And there are plenty of Arabs who will attest to that as well, if they have the boldness, if they're brave enough to do that because they risk their lives when they say that kind of thing. Uh, and also we, we hear uh, um, the European Union, hear the British government saying that the expansion of Jewish settlements is an obstacle to peace and it actually then prevents the establishment of a Palestinian state. Um, That's how true, by the way. That's absolutely true. Not that it's an absolute obstacle to peace, but it is the single most effective obstacle to the establishment of a Palestinian state. Mia culpa. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have to also explain that there's a fact that, uh, you know, if we, we look at the, the peace process, we look at the disengagement of Gaza, we look at Israel's disengagement of southern Lebanon, that security zone that kept uh, Israel as a buffer zone, uh, that when Israel did that in the eyes of the Arab world, it looked like Israel was conceding and um, looking like Israel didn't have that will to actually fight, which sent out the wrong message. So what is the great danger with the current Palestinian leadership of Abbas that if, for example, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, makes peace with Abbas today, what guarantees has Israel got that he can stay in power for more than six months 
and that uh, a genocidal terrorist organization like Hamas won't take over. Well, I think you're right. The, the threat is real. Uh, on the other hand, I don't believe Netanyahu is going to be signing any peace deals with Abbas anytime soon. And he's as good as said that. I mean, he basically is putting out uh, the same gestures to peace that we've been putting out since 1967, since 1948. We're willing to sit down in peace uh, and, and, and negotiate and all that kind of things. But we know, we know that the Arab side is not going to willing to do it because they can never really and truly recognize Israel, recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Um, they can't because it runs against everything they believe and everything they stand for. And uh, so I'm really not that concerned that we're looking at a peace deal with Abbas. Uh, and we have the example of uh, Gaza, which is really proven to the Israeli public as a whole. Today we have an overwhelming majority of the Israeli public who are against any further territory withdrawals because they understand that when we pull out, the worst of the terrorists come in instead and fill that. There is no vacuum anywhere, certainly not in the Middle East. And if we look around us at the horrific civil wars and terrorism that's going on and ISIS and, and you know, before that Al-Qaeda and all these sorts of groups, not to mention Iran and, and the terrorism that it is supporting and the nuclear power that is still there, ready to, to be developed. Um, we're living in too dangerous a neighborhood to be able to take the risk of pulling out from any additional territory, which no question would then be filled by the worst terrorists in the Middle East. Uh, and Sanja, can you help our viewers? Because um, many occasions that, uh, including myself, get involved in discussions, or discussions with politicians and discussions with various other people. And of course, our opponents are very, very quick to judge Israel by saying that the Jewish settlements are a breach to international law, but they can never actually name what international law they're actually breaching. But I think it's important that we all have the arguments to, to counter that. So what advice can you give our viewers to counter the lies that Israel is breaching international law with these Jewish settlements? Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna do a very quick wrap up on this because it is a very complicated issue. But I think if you h highlight the salient points, you can make the effective argument, okay? So first of all, we are now 1917 to 2017. We are 100 years from the Balfour Declaration. And the Balfour Declaration is key because that Balfour Declaration essentially gave Britain the mandate for Palestine. And its mandate was to allow Jewish settlement throughout the area. Now that mandate was then encompassed into the treaties uh, that concluded World War I and was then adopted by the United Nations after World War II. That language never changed, always. It, the, the British mandate was there to allow close Jewish settlement throughout the area. The State of Israel is established, and after the War of Independence, which again, all the Arabs attacked us, we ended up with the State of Israel not including Judea and Samaria. Israeli law was then applied to that area, recognized by the United Nations, and therefore, the Balfour Declaration, no, or, or that language as it was passed on, no longer applied to that area. However, it continued to apply to the area that we call Judea and Samaria, that the world calls the West Bank. And nothing has ever changed that because the Jordanians illegally occupied that area. Now Israel is occupying or administering that area. No one has annexed it. There has been no international treaty or legal instrument that has changed the status of Judea and Samaria. And therefore, especially in the areas that we have not handed to the Palestinians under Oslo, for, such as Area A, for their exclusive control, the areas that remain under Israeli control, Area C, remain Israel's to settle because that original legal statement giving the right of close Jewish settlement in that area Nothing legal has ever changed that original, those original documents. Excellent. I think that's a very convincing argument, so thank you for that one. Uh, but what would you say to uh, the likes of Caroline uh, Glick, who's a big supporter of, the, of, of your uh, movement, in which she advocates that now, under President Trump in the United States, it's time to annex Judea and Samaria and corporate into Israel? I happen to agree with her. I think Caroline Glick has hit it on the head. I think there are a number of proposals being floated today that talk about various levels of annexation, uh, annexing part or all of Judea and Samaria, uh, or perhaps doing it in stages, and I am an advocate of all of those 
uh, approaches. Um, what we see today in the Israeli government is, um, and, I, and I understand where the government is coming from, you have Netanyahu, I believe in his heart of hearts, is incredibly supportive of settlement throughout Judea and Samaria and would love nothing better than to annex the entire area. On the other hand, he's the one dealing with the prime ministers and the presidents that get him on the phone and they say, don't you dare and don't you dare. President Trump himself made amazingly supportive statements. He talked about it was up to the Jews and the Arabs to come to their own agreement. He talked about the fact that Judea and Samaria, uh, Jews have a right to live in Judea and Samaria. And I, and I do believe that his presidency presents unique opportunities to Israel, but by the same token, he has made some other comments since becoming president that has indicated he's looking to start, a to start a negotiations. He wants to get a deal going. I'm not sure what kind of deal he envisions. Uh, and from what we understand, the uh, American administration is sending messages to Israel saying we don't, and, and Trump himself said, they don't think that continue to build is a very um, positive thing right now. And, and I can see Netanyahu trying to juggle all of that. He's trying to juggle what his heart is saying. He needs to juggle what his cabinet ministers want him to be doing. Uh, and at the same time, he has to be responding to Trump and, and to others. I personally believe that Israel still needs to be bold, and um, especially in today's Middle East, where there is so much instability surrounding us. Those countries, America, Europe, need Israel. Yes, we're tiny Israel, but we are an island of democracy and stability in a very problematic area. And I think Israel has the ability to right now stand up and say, look guys, we have to look after our own interests, which we believe is also in your interests, we're annexing. And now, Arabs, sit down with us, face it, you're gonna be under Israeli rule. Let's now talk about improving your lives, which Israel can do in a way the Palestinian Authority has never been interested in doing. Uh, what's it like as well, knowing that you've got uh, two very powerful people in, in the cabinet, in the Israeli cabinet, in Naftali Bennett and um, also the Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, Zivi Hotalevi, who I uh, had the pleasure of interviewing uh, last December, who's uh, a very, very strong and powerful supporter. Of, uh, of your communities? Well, they're great. Well, Sipi Khotubeli is unfortunately doesn't have the kind of power we wish he would have because Netanyahu has retained the foreign minister position, uh, which is, she's only the deputy foreign minister. Uh, he initially promised her that she would have full reign and he would just be a figurehead. But indeed, when it comes to Judea and Samaria, he is restricting the extent to which she can change some of the messages, and, and, and that's problematic. Naftali Bennett is there. He's the head of an independent party. He it doesn't owe anything to Netanyahu. Uh, and I think he's playing a very good game of, on the one hand, reminding Netanyahu about these ideological commitments that he has made, but at the same time, making sure he doesn't uh, tilt the balance too much and, and disrupt the government. Uh, let's have a, a, a look at uh, Donald Trump's and uh, his administration's approach to the uh, Jewish settlements. Israel's government has taken a string of controversial steps in the few weeks since Donald Trump took office, raising questions about the relationship between the new administration, the Israeli government and Palestinian authorities, and the potential for peace in the region. So what has the Israeli government done? It approved more than 6,000 new housing units in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. And its parliament approved a legislation that retroactively legalizes thousands of Jewish settler homes on this contested land. It uh, effectively opens the floodgates to the potential annexation of the West Bank. It crosses a very, very thick red line. Israelis say they have a biblical and historical connection to these lands. I do believe that our rights over our fatherland is something that cannot be denied. But there are also political and security interests. More than 500,000 Israelis and 2.6 million Palestinians are estimated to live there. Why is this important? Most world governments consider Israeli settlement activity illegal under international law and an impediment to peace with the Palestinians. The Obama administration regularly denounced Israel's settlement building. The United Nations has for decades pursued a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Two states for two groups of people. I think the problem that we lack, uh, for which we lack peace with the Palestinians, is the simple, uh, a simple truth. The persistent Palestinian refusal for the last uh, 70 years, 68 years since Israel's uh, 
Israel was established, to recognize a Jewish state in any boundaries. The boundary between the two states is still subject to dispute and negotiation. Palestinians refuse to negotiate until settlement activity stops. It's a theft. It's looting Palestinian land. It is putting the last nail on the coffin of the two-state solution. So what does Donald Trump have to do with this? Mr. Trump has indicated he will be more sympathetic to Israeli interests. I was asked by everyone to wait until the 20th of the month, when the Donald Trump era as President of the United States will begin. Trump gives us hope. Ahead of winning the election, his advisors implied he wouldn't force a two-state solution. Mr. Trump has also supported relocating the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which would effectively recognize the city as Israel's capital. Talk of this has angered Palestinians who want to establish East Jerusalem as the capital of their future state. If you will bring the American Embassy to Jerusalem, we will have no peace here. If you will support uh, the colonization here, the settlement, there will be no peace. President Trump also named a hardliner to be U.S. ambassador to Israel, his lawyer David Friedman. Mr. Friedman in the past has said he does not believe Israeli settlement activity is illegal. He's also raised millions of dollars for a major Israeli settlement in the West Bank. But in a surprising move, a recent statement from the White House cautioned Israel concerning its construction of new settlements. While we don't believe the existence of settlements is an impediment to peace, the construction of new settlements or the expansion of existing settlements beyond their current borders may not be helpful in achieving that goal. However, adding that the Trump administration has not taken an official position on settlement activity. All eyes are now on President Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who are due to meet next week. Well, the uh, pressures certainly of uh, Bibi Netanyahu in terms of pressure from the previous administration, which is the Obama administration, to halt uh, settlement constructions. I have, to, I have to ask you, and I think watching that uh, news item there, Sonja, that how much does the media play a role in exaggerating and almost demonising um, your community? Oh, it plays a huge role because you will very often find uh, an example on this uh, film that we just saw, there was a, a piece of legislation that has been passed and the truth of the matter is this is legislation having to do with the legal status of Jews living in Judea and Samaria, giving us the ability to um, litigate these issues in a regular court, same that we would, we and the Arabs would have if we were living on the other side of the so-called Green Line. And um, it has been labeled by some of the people on the far left as uh, legalizing uh, land grabs from Palestinians, which is so far from the truth. But then you see that the media just adopts that phraseology without giving you know, another perspective. Thankfully, in this film, they did also show a, a statement from Yariv Levine, but without a, a real um, uh, answer as to what's really really going on. And, and I think that's, that's very important. These are complicated issues, uh, and it's very sad when the media, where, when its assumption is Israel has done wrong. And it's, it's not fair, but it really influences public opinion. And that's, the, that's what we've got to win, isn't it? Uh, public opinion. Um, and, and I suppose the best illustration of this is, is that um, I did an interview in, in the European Parliament with the um, former head of the um, European Union's uh, Parliament's uh, chairman of their Foreign Affairs and Select Committee. Uh, he was in a discussion. Now, uh, he wanted to know what all the controversy was surrounding the Jewish settlements. So he went there for himself. And when he saw them, he kind of fell in love with them and became their, uh, the most strongest advocate uh, for the uh, Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria in the European Parliament because he saw it with his own eyes. How important is it that um, for people to understand the truth of the situation that they visit uh, communities like yours in the biblical heartland of Israel? It's absolutely vital and I would say it's not just important for parliamentary heads and leaders and important people and journalists. All those are very important. But what I want to do is invite everybody watching this program, all of you out there, uh, come to Israel. 
come and visit Judea and Samaria. Any of you who will be in Israel this October uh, for the Feast of Tabernacles, we have two day tours, two one day tours, one day in Judea and one day in Samaria. Get the information on our website, sign up, have the experience of a lifetime. See for yourself. And you know what? If you're not sure how you feel about it, then give us a chance to show you our perspective and you'll come back and then we'll have a conversation. But I have a feeling, especially if you're Christian, especially if you believe the word of God, when you see how God is fulfilling prophecy in our own communities and you meet the people that are living there, you'll have a whole different perspective. And in, in five minutes left of the program, uh, Sandra, how can our, our, our wonderful viewers get behind you and your communities um, living and working uh, and fulfilling the Zionist dream of re-establishing these ancient towns and villages um, that were in existence thousands and thousands of years ago? Well, we talked about coming, and that's certainly important. In addition to signing up on the tours that I mentioned, uh, if you are part of a tour group, leading a tour group, if you know people who are involved in a tour group coming to Israel, we set up tour programs for tour groups from all over the world. We offer our services free of charge, and it's something that we're doing almost every week. We have at least one, if not more, tour groups that are coming through us. And in that way, we really are expanding our reach. People from all over the world are coming in, and that's really a way that people like you can help uh, connecting us with those groups. Um, get on our website, become educated, sign up for our mailing list, uh, email, post, both, either, whichever. Very, very important. And getting more people that you know signed up on our mailing list or forwarding to them the interesting articles that you receive from us, helping people in your immediate circle, whether it's friends, people from church, uh, people at work, people that you think might be interested, expose them to this information. And thirdly, help support the people who, like you said, Simon, are the, really the spearhead of the Zionist movement today, the people who are risking their lives, who are living in places that are often more dangerous than anywhere else in order to set our claim to, to develop uh, and make this area thrive. Uh, and we need help. We need help to protect these people. We're funding security cameras. We're funding um, educational programs for children, for special needs children. We're helping families that, ha that don't have means, that need help, food packages. The whole gamut of humanitarian aid is things that, uh, this is what we're involved in. And if you believe that we need to be there and you want to support our presence there, get on our website, make a donation. This is something that would be so helpful to us as we continue to expand our reach and strengthen the presence of the Jewish communities in the heart of biblical Israel. Now I have to mention uh, in, in close of the program, uh, my good friends and also avid viewers of this program, Phil and, and Bren from uh, South Wales. Yes. And I know that they recently went on one of your tours and um, Phil was kind of blown away uh, by, the, by the tour and also meeting leaders of your community and, and seeing the ancient biblical sites as well and seeing how the, the desert has come to life. Absolutely, and, and Phil and Brenda are our UK representatives, and whenever I'm here in the UK, they've arranged most of my tour, uh, and they're wonderful supporters, and I'm hoping that they will come back with lots more friends on our next tour and um, join us, join them. And if you want to contact or be in touch with our UK representatives, with Phil and Brenda, just send me an email from our website, and I'll connect you with them personally and they can come and tell you more in your own community here in the UK, tell you more about what we're doing. And just very briefly before we go, wh what is the um, biggest challenge is facing your community at the moment and, and how can our viewers really pray for you and, and your very precious community there living in the biblical heartland of Israel? I would say right now our challenges throughout Judea and Samaria is getting building permits. We have Thank God, 430,000 Jews living in the communities in Judea and Samaria, and that doesn't include the people who are living in the newer areas of Jerusalem. And our children are growing up, and they're getting married, and they want to come back and live where we are. And we have families that want to move in. We have the, a potential that is amazing for growth and stability, but we need those building permits. And that is something that really we need prayer for our Prime Minister Netanyahu, that he will be bold enough to give us the ability to build or whatever we need. 
Uh, Sandra Boris, thank you so much for being my guest on today's Middle East report, all the way from the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria. Thank, thank you, you, Simon. Great to be here. Pleasure. And I just want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East report. It's important that uh, we stand with the uh, Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, which is the biblical heartland of Israel. We ensure that they don't become demonized and that we speak up for them because they are living the biblical dream in bringing those ancient communities back to life, living in an extremely dangerous area of Israel. And uh, this song is in dedication to the children and to the families of those living in Judea and Samaria. So thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. Thank you. 